Hey, everybody. Uh, appreciate you guys sticking around instead of bailing on me uh, for an early lunch. Uh, I've got some good stuff in store for you. Um, so uh, I'll just dive right into it because I'll, I'll tell you, I originally wrote this talk to be about an hour. I've given it and it's extended into uh, an hour and a half, two hours because people just wouldn't leave and they just questions kept coming because I, I'm passionate about what the, the topic is here. Um, but I'm going to dive right into it because I've got less time than that. So um, my name is uh, Eric Capuano. I'm the uh, founder and CTO of a company here in Austin called Recon InfoSec. I'm also a Forensics 508 instructor for SANS, so I actually do enjoy uh, teaching about this kind of stuff. Um, I'm the creator and team lead for OpenSock.io, which is a 100% free open source platform that we run at uh, DEF CON, B-Sides, you name it, um, that's actually using a lot of the tools I'm about to show you. Um, and, uh, and I encourage you to check it out if you're ever at an event where we're running it. It's, uh, it's pretty awesome. I'm a 1 before operator for the Air National Guard, SOC manager, former SOC manager for Texas DPS. I see a couple of former colleagues in the house. And the, the new Blue Team Village at DEF CON, my team, we, that's one of the places that we run OpenSock. And uh, last year, 300 participants, tons of fun. But enough about that. Okay, this slide I love because I usually have to have a conversation with an audience about like, okay, I know open source is a bad word, except I don't think so, not here, right? This, ACOD, I love this conference because everybody in this room is on the bandwagon, right? So I'm not even gonna go into like, you know, the concepts of why open source really deserves a second look, especially in enterprise, because there's so many freaking awesome tools out there that are open source um, that in some ways I would argue toe to toe meet or exceed their, their enterprise counterparts. Now, your mileage may vary, not every tool's made the same, but, uh, but uh, I, won't, I won't spend too much time on that one for this audience because it's, I think we all share the sentiment. But the other problem is there's just so many choices out there, right? Like there's open source galore all over the place. So like which ones are worth my time? Which ones should I focus on and choose? Um, there's tons of great ones up here. Um, I've zeroed in um, based on the topic here, right? Threat hunting, right? So there's all kinds of awesome tools here that are worth a conversation and discussion, but I'm gonna only cover a couple today that I think are most relevant for my use case and the best bang for the buck based on my, my extensive uh, uh, experience with them. So I'm gonna talk about the Hive, and the reason for that is because if you're not documenting in, a, in an effective way, in a collaborative way, um, I'm sorry, but you're not threat hunting. Okay, you're just, you're, just, you're just searching through Splunk at that point or whatever your tool is. So the Hive I'm going to talk about for a minute because not only is it really awesome for just case management and tracking analyst activities, but I've heard a lot of awesome um, uh, uh, speakers talking about correlation and connecting observables and things like that. The Hive does all that. It's amazing. Um, then I'm going to go into my use case of gray log with um, win, uh, wind log beater beats from uh, Elastic alongside Sysmon. I'm a huge Sysmon fan. I know a lot of folks in here are familiar with Sysmon. We're going to talk about why that one's awesome as well. And then lastly, I'm going to touch on one of my favorite tools is the, uh, the uh, combination of Collide and OS Query, right? Now, we're not, just, we're not just using that flight data recorder of, you know, event logs shipping off of our endpoints. Now I've got real-time hunt, real-time query capability with an open source tool given to us by, by Facebook. So no one can say Facebook's 100% evil, uh, only 99% because they gave us OS Query. Okay, so like I said, so the reason I'm touching on the Hive, you know, it's not a threat hunting tool, but it's a collaboration tool for SOCs. And again, if you're not collaborating like pros, you're not threat hunting. So this it has to start here. So the Hive is fantastic. I'm actually um, really close with developers of it. I've helped develop analyzers for it. Um, and um, at, at SOCs that I've run for the last several years, we've literally um, opened and closed thousands of cases in the Hive, and I will, uh, I will, I will put it up against any of the, the, the fancy stuff that's out today, Phantom, et cetera. Um, so here's a, a screenshot of kind of like a case, a case detail in the Hive. I mean, there's a lot of information going on here, so I'm going to kind of draw your attention to a couple things that I really like. Um, over here on the right, they call this the flow. This is, no kidding, a real-time stream of all analyst activities that are happening right now. So if you've got 15 analysts in your SOC, you're going to sit here and you're going to see like a Twitter feed of, you know, you know, Joe is looking at this observable, Susie's looking at this, uh, is working on this case. And what's awesome about it is um, I can put all kinds of descriptions, uh, metadata, details, tags, metrics, whatever I want to track for my, uh, for my uh, reporting, et cetera, the Hive can handle it. Um, my, my little clicker here is not, not getting along with me. So um, one of the most powerful capabilities of the Hive is, again, loading those observables, right? Because as you're working cases, you're going through and you're pulling out uh, files, you're pulling out hashes, you're pulling out IP addresses. And you know, lo documenting those things is all great and everything, right? But if you're throwing them into Evernote, if you're throwing them into uh, Microsoft uh, OneNote, uh, guess what it's not doing? It's not telling you that you had a similar case that used that exact same IP address six months ago, 
right? The Hive, with its elastic search back in, is doing exactly that. So that's why loading observables into the Hive is actually cooler than just throwing them into a notepad document, um, because what it's going to do is it's going to correlate previous cases for you. But even cooler than that, it's got this concept of analyzers. So you know how you've got 15 browser tabs open right now? Virus Total and OTX and all these other things that you use to look for, you know, is this IP bad or not? Hey, guess what? There's these Python scripts behind the hive in an engine called Cortex that will take every one of those observables and hit all of those OSINT sources, some that you've heard of, many that you haven't. And now all of a sudden, I've got 47 different little short reports on a single IP address telling me what's what, right? So now we're, we're speeding up the triage, right? I'm, I'm now automating the things that my analyst are doing. And guess what? Oh, and by the way, gray noise. Gray noise is one of those awesome analyzers. So we're, we're hitting gray noise now. For every single one of these IPs, we're seeing what gray noise has to say about it and all the awesome open um, free APIs that are out there to use, including the non-free ones. Um, but uh, that's fantastic stuff. Now this, this is that magic I was telling you about, that correlation capability. So what the Hive is telling me here is, hey, guess what? This observable you've got here, um, this observable is, or I'm sorry, I'm, we're looking at a case here. This observable has uh, a relationship with five other cases. That could be a case from a week ago. That could be a case from months ago, right? But now we're getting somewhere because this otherwise maybe low risk threat that the analyst is looking at just just up up leveled a little bit, right? Because oh, wait a second, this might not just be an opportunistic phishing campaign. Um, there's a, there's a common observable that's been seen here for months now, but a different analyst worked it on the previous case. So right now you're getting that correlation. Fantastic for a free thousand dollar tool, right? All right. So enough about documentation. You guys are all great documenters. I know that. So we'll we'll skip off. We'll we'll move on from that. All right. So let's talk a little bit about Graylog. Now I get the question, why not Elk? Graylog is elk, okay? Graylog is elk without the K. So if you're an elk person, awesome. If you're a Graylog person, awesome. If you're a Splunk person, guess what? It all, it's all the same stuff. I'm just saving a lot more money than you are. Um, so, so again, at the heart of it, the reason that Graylog is awesome is because it solves a fundamental problem that every organization has, and it's that you must be ingesting data at a central point, right? If, you're, if your plan is, uh, we can always pull event logs off the domain controller if there's ever a compromise, you bet. For the last two hours, you'll have event logs, right? Um, so aggregation is key. As long as you're bringing that stuff in, I won't go into the basics of Graylog. There's a lot of folks in here that are probably pretty savvy on that stuff. Um, so let's get into the real basic stuff that we can get. Now, once we're aggregating our data, I could do basic stuff like least prevalence, right? Hey, show Show me the least prevalent user agents coming in on my, my OWA server, right? Hey, interesting, uh, we've, got a, we've got a shell shock exploit and a user agent. That's super weird. Um, and I literally can find that just because I looked at the least, the, the five least common, you know, uh, observations in my user agents. Okay, that's pretty basic stuff. Some other things that are more centered around detection, which is why I, I underline the word detection here, because this is a threat hunting talk, so I'm gonna skip over this stuff here pretty quickly. But detection is awesome too, right? Because threat hunting, computers, and internet, cyber. Hang on, guys. <laughs> I swear I've done this before. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna put down the fancy clicker here, and I'm just gonna... I'm just going to click the button like everybody else. OK, so, um, so the reason that, uh, that I talk about pipelines here for a second is because another thing about threat hunting is it should absolutely be informing continuous monitoring. So as your threat hunters are finding awesome stuff, uh, hey, look, uh, indicators of compromise, right? Um, interesting activity, anomalous things. That should be kicking over to your SOC, who's then writing continuous monitoring detection Right? Whether that's a scheduled Splunk query, whether that's a gray log pipeline, right? So we talk about detection for a second here because it is absolutely part of this. So what we can do in gray log is we can write these, these, they call them pipeline rules, where I can basically, I can query, or not query, I'm sorry, but I can pre-process every event that comes into my stack, and I can say things like, look, if the command field contains any of these strings, right, like VSS admin delete shadows, right, which is the absolute most common precursor to a ransomware attack, right? I'm going to delete your, uh, I'm going to delete your volume shadow snapshots because that's going to be your first method of trying to restore what I've done to you, right? So there's a whole long list of these. There's literally hundreds and hundreds of these gray log detection pipelines that you can get on GitHub. Um, Ion Storm is actually one of my favorite um, uh, authors of these things, but it's fantastic stuff. But anyway, this is this is boring detection stuff. So we're going to move on. So if you're asking me, but hang on a second, how do I make all these fancy pipelines and stuff? I'll tell you. Another awesome thing about open source is that someone else has probably already solved this problem for you. I cannot speak highly enough about the Sigma project. If you have not found this yet, you need this in your life, right? Sigma has done to seam rules what Snort 
you know, did to IDS, right? With what snort rules have done for IDS. Uh, you can go, and it doesn't matter if you're a Splunk, Elk, Greylog, Elast Alert, doesn't matter. Sigma does a fantastic job of collecting an open source repository of signatures, and we'll convert them to your use case. Yes. So the, the, it's a great question. What, what's the adoption like right now? What's the success rate for adoption into Sigma and other products? The awesome thing that I'm seeing right now is things like uncoder.io coming up and saying, hey, guess what? We can convert your Sigma signature into anything under the sun. We'll convert it into a Yara signature. We'll convert it into uh, a Splunk query. And so the thing is, uh, uncoder.io. Definitely check it out. It's basically Google Translate for everything under the sun to do with uh, SecOps and signatures and things of that nature. But the, the reason I love Sigma is that this is, this is a really awesome attempt by Florian Roth to basically standardize scene queries, right? So that it doesn't matter if you're an Elk sp shop, Splunk shop, you have it. Um, and then also there's a fantastic collection of somebody's already thought about like, hey, what's process anomaly look like in Windows? If WinWord you know, drops a command prompt, I should know about that. Well, guess what? Somebody's already thought of the, the, the Splunk query for it or the Yelp query for it and wrote it into a Sigma signature. So that's fantastic stuff. But again, we're still kind of talking about detection, right? So, um, uh, but I wanted to show you, here's an example of a Sigma, of a Sigma rule. Um, really awesome uh, YAML type structure to it. So it's very well documented. Almost every good Sigma rule I've seen has a reference in it. So if you're wondering where the Sigma rule came from, guess what? There's the Threat Intel article that'll tell you um, where the inspiration for the rule was. And then cruising, cruising into the second half of the rule, it's very simple structure, right? Just simply saying, hey, look, we're, we're selecting from these fields of NID1, which be careful here, right? Because uh, of NID1, that's our sysmon for process creation. Well, when Microsoft thought, uh, thought it'd be grand to also give us a, a native Windows event log for that, 4688. So if you're, if you're writing uh, you know, seam queries or anything like that, just be mindful that you might have multiple sources for that information. But this is really straightforward, right? It's, this is pretty easy to read. If the parent image is, say, outlook.exe, and then the image, meaning the child process that was created, command prompt, PowerShell, W script, C script, you might want to take a look at it, right? That's all it's saying, right? That's all we're saying. And this, this is a very, very basic example. There's a lot of really awesome signatures in this repo I'd encourage you to take a look at. Okay, but again, as everyone in this room is probably familiar with, the thing about signatures is it only finds the things that we know are bad, right? It only finds the things that, that someone somewhere has said, hey, this is bad. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about, okay, we're departing from those signatures now. We're departing from the things that someone else already knows about. Now we're getting into the anomalistic things. And, What's awesome is if you're bringing in big data, you now have everything that you need to look for deviations from norms and look for anomalies and to go in, in hindsight, right? What happened six months ago? What happened a week ago, et cetera? So I want to talk about a couple of events that I absolutely love. Again, Sysmon is one of my favorite tools because the, the signal to noise ratio of Sysmon events is, is fantastic. Um, I, you are, we are starting to see Microsoft try to close the gap and give us the, the same value that we're getting out of Sysmon logs, but we're a ways off from feature parity here. Um, so anyway, process creation, file creation time, so for things like time stomping, network connection, right? It's fantastic because I don't like to rely on maybe Windows Firewall log is logging or not. Um, drivers being loaded. We're going to talk about some of these, some of these event IDs and where they're going to be useful for us in hunting for evil. So extremely basic use case here, right? Everybody here is going to be like, yeah, okay, great. We all know 4625, failed logon. And then I can filter out common failed, uh, failed logon reasons being, A, an expired password. Because everybody knows, right, when, you're, when your enterprise has a 90-day rotation on passwords and, uh, you know, Billy left Outlook logged onto his computer overnight and now it's brute forcing the exchange server, I don't care about that, right? So I'm looking for anything that's not on my whitelist. Or maybe I'm looking for something like uh, possible past the hash, lateral movement. So 4720, local accounts being created in my organization. How often should users be creating local accounts in my enterprise AD environment? Not very often, right? So I'm looking for, hey, show me all local user accounts being created or, right, this really fancy Boolean logic, or, you know what, show me any 4776s. NTLM authentication, which is pr predicated, not super duper common anymore, and I'm filtering out, and I don't, and, and uh, where, where it's a 4776 and the source is not one of my domain controllers, right? Now what I'm seeing is NTLM authentication coming from a workstation, right? Which is commonly when local, at, local accounts are being used to move laterally through an environment. Super simple use case, right? Just giving you a kind of a primer to get into some of the things, uh, maybe get, that get a little deeper in the rabbit hole. So again, assuming we've got Sysmon at our disposal, event ID 6, I can look at drivers being loaded across my entire organization. I can say, show me all drivers being loaded that are not in a common 
location for drivers. See, this isn't me saying, oh, hey, the latest Emotet loads a driver out of C Windows temp slash Emotet underscore LOL cyber. No, what I'm just saying is, look, I don't know where bad drivers might be coming from. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, a, I'm gonna take a, a whitelist approach and just say, show me all drivers not being loaded out of C Windows or maybe uh, I've got a list of approved drivers that I know are kind of on, you know, in, in normal in my organization. Now I'm seeing everything else, right? This, this is that difference between continuous monitoring and threat hunting, right? This is a labor of love because I'm gonna, when I run this for the first time, I'm gonna get a lot of stuff that comes back, right, in my organization. But it's all stuff that I should be building a whitelist for and then seeing what the outliers are. And then guess what? When I've developed that long paragraph, long uh, query, I'm going to turn that over to my continuous monitoring team, and they're going to alert on any deviation from that known baseline now, right? Uh, another pass the hash uh, potential is you know, 4624, successful logon in my organization, but again, using an NTLM and username not an anonymous logon. So a lot of these are already documented, right? I didn't come up with these from thin air. This is experience of saying, hey, you know, I, I've seen past the hash, and from looking at the event ID generated by that past the hash activity, I can write this query and I can look for additional uh, uh, activity that resembles that. Excuse me. Process anomalies. This is another good one. So, um, for any of you that have taken um, uh, SANS uh, 508, one of the things we love to talk about is you know, knowing normal if you intend to find evil, right? So if I know normal, meaning that, let's say, SVC host.exe should always be spawned by services or anybody that's caught on to the recent changes in Windows 10, now MSP and ENG, so uh, Defender. It used to just be, hey, services is the only proper parent for SVC host. That's recently changed. We had to update the posters for that. But now, I, all I've got to do is I can say, hey, if there's a single SVC host in my environment that has spawned from something other than one of these, I want to know about it. Because that's a very, that's a very common like hiding in plain sight technique. And I can take any one of the common Windows binaries, right? Um, and I can plug in the, the, the whitelist of what the parent child relationship ought to be, and I could find that with a pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty simple query, accounting for the fact that it could come from an event ID 1 or an event ID 4688, but the, the, the concept is the same, right? It doesn't really matter. Um, as long as I know what normal should look like, like for instance, almost in every case, the argument passed to svchost.exe dash k. So show me any instances where that dash k wasn't used, right? I'm not going to say it never happens, but I'm going to say it happens seldom enough. That's a pretty short whitelist for me to build. How about the infamous Mimi cats, right? Like, what's, what do you think is going to be more effective? Me trying to look for like every MD5 of Mimi cats binaries or for the name Mimi cats, right, to show up? Because I'm going to guess if an attacker really knows what they're doing, they're probably going to, they're going to, they're going to use a permutation that I haven't seen or that's not on virus total. They're not going to call it Mimi cats. It's going to be called something else like Hydra cats, right? So instead of trying to look for, Mimi cats, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look for the behavior of Mimi cats. I'm going to look for another event that's, co that's strictly coming from Sysmon, is I'm going to look for a, prox a process that's doing a raw read, that's accessing another process in memory. But specifically, what I'm looking for is anything that's not in C Windows, any process that didn't load out of C Windows, accessing LSAS or WinLog on in memory. Right? So now I'm, I'm not just looking for Mimi cats. I'm looking for anything that, per that, that exhibits the behavior of Mimi cats, meaning trying to pull those secrets out of memory, right? So again, right, deviating from detection or from, from our detection side of the house and more just threat hunting and looking for the behaviors of these bad things that uh, that we know exist out there in the world. All right, here's kind of another simpler use case. Um, just simply saying, yes, I'm sorry. Go. You bet. Okay, it's a great question. So basically, it, it just coming at it from a different angle, right? So you could absolutely, a matter of one of the previous examples, looking at those drivers being loaded, right? So I could absolutely trigger on, hey, drivers being loaded from weird places, um, just as easily as I can say, you know, processes accessing other processes of memory. There's another example that I don't think I have one for. It's creating remote threads, right? So process injection, process hollowing, right? The list goes on. That's the amazing thing about it is trying to cram all this into 20 minutes is impossible. But the fact of the matter is, as long as I start thinking about, look, I don't want to look for Mimi cats. 
I want to look for anything that's trying to pull secrets out of memory, which is what Mimi Katz is doing, right? So as long as I'm thinking more behavioral instead of signature-based, now I'm going to start finding all the things that, hell, I didn't even know this was possible, right? I might find something that's trying to access LSAS that's not been seen yet, right? And it's not because I've got Carbon Black or some other ridiculously expensive, which Carbon Black's a great tool, but it's, it's, literally, it's literally just because, it's literally just because I'm looking for that behavior instead of that tool. Right? And that's, that's the idea, right? But the answer is yes. The answer is yes. If you're loading weird drivers to do some sneaky stuff, I can absolutely do that. And actually, when I get to Collide, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so keeping internals internals, really, this is a really straightforward way of saying, look, we should probably not have any desktop, uh, remote desktop connections coming from outside the environment, right? And where I'm getting this source IP is internal, is just a simple RFC 1918 check. So I'm saying, look, if the source IP is not an RFC 1918 address, but the desk port is 3389, I should probably, I should probably know about that. Um, SMB tour from external IPs. Again, we've seen this in previous, you know, um, um, cases. Attackers that are that are stealing, uh, uh, stealing AD tokens and things like that by uh, by causing outbound 445 and stuff. Super simple, super simple. You guys have seen this stuff. Collide. Love, 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 love Collide. Um, Collide well, I should say, I say Collide. Um, I'm talking about OS Query. Collide is just one of the multiple front ends that exist for for OS Query. OS Query is this uh, fantastic endpoint agent that was written by Facebook, as I mentioned. Um, the folks over at um, Trail of Bits did a lot of hard work to port this over to Windows for us. And I'm going to tell you, this is the best thing to hit open source endpoint monitoring um, since Sysmon. I mean, it is, it is phenomenal. If you've ever written a SQL query, you can already use Collide. That's the awesome thing. Um, there's a lot of built-in packs. I'm going to show you some of those here in a minute. Built-in queries, essentially, you can just pull right down from GitHub, load into Collide, and now guess what? It's running like hundreds of, of hunts already for you for things that are known to be uh, anomalous, like SVC host spawning from something that's not uh, services. Um, now we've got IOC detection with things like Yara. So I can load Yara rule sets and use OS query to haunt with those, with those Yara rule sets. Um, and then the schema for, for um, basically all the different queries I can write is available to you on OS query to IO. I'm going to show you some examples here in a second. Yeah. Right now, I believe it's a Mac and Linux only right now. And it's, it's, it's a newish feature. Right, so it's not, it's not going to be as widespread as like uh, throwing it into an enterprise product yet, specifically Yara, because it, it's, it's new. It's new to OS Query. It, it will let you load an entire directory of Yara rules. I've not yet tried to load many. But here's what I do know. I do know that w the way that the table structure works, I, you know, it's, it's capable of loading hundreds of scheduled queries and, 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 and essentially hunts. So I'm 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 going to give it the benefit of the doubt that they're probably going to they're probably going to be pretty decent at the uh, the YAR rule set, but I can't personally speak to how how scalable it is yet. Um, so one of the cool things about OS Query is I can interact with it directly on the endpoint, so I can drop to a command shell and I can run any of the OS Query um, um, queries against the endpoint directly. Not a common use case, right? Because that doesn't scale very well. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a front end like Collide, and uh, and then the reference of OS Query to IOs. Uh, schemas to say, here are all the tables. So at this time, I pulled this screenshot like 30 minutes ago. There's 226 different tables of information that I can pull from an endpoint. And this is absolutely real time. And an example of some things, um, app compat shims, right? Evidence execution. So if, when you're trying to answer the question of, yeah, we found malware in the endpoint, but did it actually run, right? OK, well, let's go back and let's look at the app compat, right? Let's look at uh, prefetch. Let's look at the evidence of execution. I can now pull that back not only on one endpoint, but thousands of endpoints at one time. So I can pull back all the evidence of execution, filtering for maybe the name of an executable, um, which is kind of cool. Um, auto exec, right? So looking at persistence mechanisms across my organization. Now, what's awesome about auto exec is it's, a, it's essentially a, co a compilation of several other tables, like services, scheduled tasks, startup items, et cetera. So now I can just simply say, hey, you know what? Show me all the auto exec entries across all my domain controllers, and then I'm going to look for differences. If I've got 20 do domain controllers, and there's an auto run or a service on one that's not on the others, I've just kind of narrowed my focus, right? Pretty awesome capability. How about digital code signing, right? Ooh, scary. When, when uh, we start to see digital, digitally signed malware, OK, great. But you know what? I can actually use authentic the Authenticode plugin to then query for the signature status of, of binary sitting on disk, and furthermore, also um, get the status of processes that are running. 
PowerShell events, right? We all know uh, bad guys love PowerShell. So now what I can do is if I'm not already ingesting those PowerShell events into a seam, which I should be, I can actually use OS Query to in real time search across all my endpoints for specific commandlets being used, right? Um, creating new, uh, new um, uh, objects, downloading things from the internet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm getting the, 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 the the short time si signal. How about WMI, right? This is one of the most evasive persistence mechanisms that exist right now. I'm going to tell you that right now because I teach this stuff in depth. And it's, it's a tough problem to solve. It really is. So the fact, Sysmon can actually do that as of, uh, I want to say, 8. But, but, but now OS Query is giving me another, another mechanism to query for WMI script event consumers to look for those, uh, those, those additional evasive persistence mechanisms. So here's what this looks like. Um, if, if I log into um, to Collide, what I'm going to get is a list of all my endpoints, my organization with some basic stats, et cetera. And then I'm going to jump over to the query table, and I'm going to start writing queries. And like I mentioned, very, very familiar to those of you that have messed with SQL. Hey, select the name and the PID from the processes table. And I could run that against a single system. I could run it against 10,000 systems at one time. Um, and it's going to come back. Now, I might not want processes off of 10,000 systems, but you get the drift. Now, here's where we get real fancy with it. So I could actually query for a particular registry key, and I can start to use wild cards just like I do in SQL, and I can say, look, show me all matches from the registry where the key is like this. So now I'm looking for the debugger option that's used, that's used sometimes in persistence mechanisms, mechanisms as well. So when I, when I develop all these really awesome queries, and I'm like, you know what, that's great when I'm manually hunting. But I want this stuff to run like on a, on a scheduled basis, right? I want to hunt for you know, this debugger option on all my endpoints on an hourly basis. That's where packs come into hand, in, in handy. Now, all these right here, these are all the default packs you can pull down from their GitHub, right? So somebody else has done all the gray matter thinking for you and created all these different queries that you can just load. And guess what? You're not hunting for these things. And then you build upon that, and you run all your, uh, your queries for bad things. Looking for listening processes. Since I'm short on time, I'm going to skip several of these. You're going to get my slides, so don't worry about that. So listening processes, that's cool and all. Um, account activity. If I know that Vibranium is compromised, I can immediately search every endpoint in my organization for systems where Vibranium's logged in. Um, deviations from normal, right? Looking for those process anomalies. SVC host spawning from a parent that it shouldn't be spawning from, right? Hiding in plain sight. Um, processes with incorrect paths. SVC host where the location is not sys32 or syswile64, right? Simple, simple, simple things. And, you know, the sky is the limit on what your imagination can come up with for these. Yes. What, what's the uh, impact of resources? On Love it. I wouldn't, I, I'd be worried if you didn't care, right? So, the folks at OS Query have put, and I'm sorry, the question was, what's the resource impact, right? Because, wait, hold on, another agent on the endpoint that's actually able to query everything under the sun, that's got to end badly. I'm going to tell you right now, the folks at OS Query thought about that. And now, that's actually, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse. OS Query will not let you write a greedy query. So if you say, hey, I want you to hash every file in the file system, it's going to sit there and look at you. Because it knows better. It knows that that would be an extremely resource intensive process. So if you, w as you're mastering OS query, you're going to learn that uh, I got to get pretty, I got to get pretty specific. I got to say, you know what, hash everything in this, in this directory. Uh, and I can even get recursive if I want to get da daring. But it's going to prevent you from blowing your own foot off. So the resource um, utilization of OS query is nominal. I mean, it is, it is not, a, not an issue. And I've used it on thousands of endpoints. So it's good stuff. Um, okay, malware can hide. Uh, malware can hide, but it must run, right? So one of my favorite examples to give is list all processes where on disk equals zero. It is literally that easy. It will show me all processes that do not have a binary mapped to disk. Boom, I just solved your uh, eternal blue problem. No, okay, that's not that simple, right? But the point I'm making is if, if a process is running and it doesn't have a binary on disk, OS Query is a built-in mechanism for that. And it's a true false flag or a one or a zero. So I've just you know, bridge the gap of $100,000 solution or OS query, and I'm looking for fileless malware. Pretty cool stuff. Um, I already talked to you a little bit about autoexec, so I'll skip that one here. Evidence of execution. OK, yep, yep, I'm, I'm wrapping up. You bet. All done. Actually, yeah, two more slides, three more slides, 12, 15 more slides. I'm just kidding. PowerShell activity, good stuff. Looking for downloads, right? If I'm using PowerShell to download evil things, easy thing to find. Unsigned code, right? Show me all processes that are running where the authentic, and you notice what I'm doing here is I'm doing a join. So I'm saying list the processes, then do a join on the authentic code table and show me all the running processes where the digital code signing status is missing, meaning there's code running on the system that is not digitally signed. Wow. There, there's an example output, right? There's, there's an example output of, okay, you got running processes with PIDs and the code signing status of the process. 
Good stuff, good stuff. And uh, this is literally the last slide, second last slide. Um, <laughs> 10 more slides, I promise. No, this is, this is it. So what I really want to talk about is, uh, is what's on the horizon for, for OS Query. They're giving us disk forensics capability, so I could do index parsing. I could do NTFS carving. Um, it's incredible. Alternate data streams, the rest, is, uh, the rest is online. So that's all I got for you. I really appreciate your attention today.